Morning, everyone, and um, welcome to the Data Science and Industry Student Workshop, which is being hosted by the Data Science Across Disciplines Research Group within the Institute for the Future of Knowledge. Um, this institute bring, this workshop brings together a variety of academics across the University of Johannesburg, each with relevant expertise within the field of data science. Um, the aim of the workshop is to um, basically provide a platform that can give you an overview of some of the core computational, mathematical, and programming concepts, ideas, and methods which are relevant to the field of data science. So each day has been dedicated to a specific theme where an expert will take you through relevant educational content as well as practical examples. Um, specifically, this workshop is aimed at students at third year level and honors. So that is uh, the level that most of the material will be pitched at, um, as well as any supporting documentation is provided. Um, our first speakers for today are Kelly Liu, who leads the Advanced Analytics and Artificial Intelligence team at SAS South Africa, and then Melissa Yankees, who is also a part of the team. Uh, they will provide us today with an introduction to the use of SAS in data science. Um, I'd like to thank you both very much for being here and being willing to be a part of this um, the workshop. Um, but before they start, I just wanted to make a few announcements. This um, morning session is going to be recorded. We've had quite a few people ask us to please record where possible. Um, and our speakers have given us, um, uh, has told us that they're perfectly willing to have today be recorded. If you have any questions or you just want to make a comment, please feel free to use the chat um, functionality of Zoom. Um, it will be monitored. So your question might not be answered exactly when you ask it, but the speakers are aware of it and they will definitely um, make sure that they answer your question when appropriate. Um, so yes, thank you very much, um, Kelly and Melissa for being here. We really appreciate it and please take it away. Thank you, Prof. Um, thank you everyone for attending the session today. And thank you for the introduction. Um, Melissa, if you just head on to the next slide, we'll just tell you a little bit more about the two of us. So I'm Kelly Liu, as already mentioned, we are from SAS South Africa, and we're specifically in the customer advisory team. So what that means is that we will go into uh, various different kinds of customers and we will go and advise them on best practices, help them overcome some of the challenges that they encounter in their artificial intelligence uh, projects. But uh, prior to this, you know, when I was in university, I actually didn't study data science. I also came from a very different background. I actually studied quantity surveying. So I was able to make a transition from that right into data science as soon as I got my first job. Melissa, will you introduce yourself as well? Sure. Hi, thank you all so much for having us today. So as Kelly mentioned, I'm also part of the customer advisory team looking mm -hmm. after um, artificial intelligence and advanced analytics. Uh, my academic background is also not in data science. I actually started off with um, economics and then branched off to econometrics and statistics. And immediately when I started working, I started off as a technical grad at SAS and have been in the field of data science for the uh, past five years. Um, yeah, so that's me. Thanks, Melissa. Sure. Just a very quick look at the agenda for today. For the first part of the session, we're just going to give you a brief introduction to AI so you have a better understanding because we actually find that there's a lot of misunderstandings and miscon misconceptions when it comes to AI. And then we're going to go into two of the more exciting and newer pieces of um, AI technology that we see being used a lot in a very big variety of industries. We're also going to um, list a couple of examples of how exactly it's being implemented and how you might be interacting with these kinds of AI. And then to finish off, we're going to share with you some of the programs that we have at SAS that can help you become a certified data scientist, as well as some soft skills that you might need in your career as a data scientist. All right, let's just, before we jump in, I also want to let you know that um, as we go through the session, there's going to be a couple of small, quick questions that you can answer. And if you participate in the quiz and get all four questions right, we will enter you into a draw for a prize. And the prize is going to be some Bluetooth wireless earbuds, as well as a wireless charger for your phone. And it's also a stand that you can use to hold your phone. So some pretty cool prizes. 
Um, to answer the quiz, make sure you send a private message to me. So instead of sending to everyone, just make sure you click the drop down button and find me in the list and you can send me your answers. After the session today, we'll collect all the answers from the chat and we will see um, who got all the questions right and we'll do a random selection from those who got everything right. And um, your profs will get in contact with you to get your contact details and we will deliver that prize to your home or an address of your choosing. Yeah, so pay attention, you might be able to get a prize today. So before we get on to the, all the cool things about AI, I just wanted to get us all on the same page about what AI is. And when I ask this question, I get a variety of answers. And just to name a few, you know, some people say that they don't know, which is fair enough. And some people say things like Siri or Alexa. And of course, the majority of answers are answers like the Terminator or something like the Matrix as if it's something really scary that's going to take over the world and enslave humanity in a post-apocalyptic world. So I do get a lot of varied answers, but regardless of what definition they give me, most of the answers have one thing in common. People tend to think that AI is kind of out there. They think it's science fiction or it's still being researched on and have very limited uses and applications. But before we continue on, Let's just get, get it clear. Firstly, there's a, a broad definition for AI is any computer system that can perform a task done by humans. It doesn't have to be this Hollywood inspired self aware super robot or brain that can do everything a human does. It just needs to do one thing. For example, there are a lot of heavily manual operations in accounting that is automated and computers can take care of that without human input. And second, it's not new at all. Next slide, please, Melissa. The theories around AI have existed for hundreds of years. If we think back into you know, Greek mythology, if you're familiar, Talos was basically a giant bronze robot. And Aristotle you know, described a formal and mechanical way of thinking. If you don't know what it is, there's the famous example of um, if all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal, which to me pretty much sounds like an if then statement in programming. But it all accelerated and became tangible in 1950 with Alan Turing. I'm sure we're all familiar with the Turing test. A year after that, the first AI program was written. It was designed to play checkers, and then another was designed to play chess. A few years later, in 1955, the first self learning game was created self-learning or machine learning. It means we no longer explicitly program the computers to do the task. Instead, we provide them with data and use machine learning algorithms for the computers to learn the patterns. In 1956, Minsky and McCarthy for the very first time used the term artificial intelligence, which has really just stuck around until today. And in the 1960s, the first chatbot was developed. It could talk to you on any topic you wanted, and there was even a version where it had the persona of a psychotherapist. And back in the day, it reportedly helped and even positively influenced a lot of people. And it's actually still available today, so if you're interested in checking it out, just Google Eliza chatbot. We often associate self-driving cars with our fellow South African Elon Musk. But actually, the first autonomous vehicle was developed in 1979 at Stanford. So as you can see, AI is really not a new concept, but one that we are continuously refining and improving. And today we have autonomous cars that can drive better and safer than humans. We have AlphaGo that can play Go better than the world champion. And we now also have AI that can diagnose medical issues significantly better than human doctors. Next slide, please, Melissa. But, you know, other than those, you know, amazing use cases, there's actually a lot of AI around us also. There's a lot of different AIs that's actually sitting on your phones in your pockets right now. When you pick up your phone and AI is looking at your face and determining whether it's you to let you into the device, 
when you open up your favorite social media app, AI decides you know, what content to show and hide from you. When you're typing a message and you know, autocorrect is doing its thing, that's a natural language AI in the back end. Similar kinds of AI can also check in emails content and detect and filter spam. And I'm sure you know we always talk about the ads that you, that you see um, on any website just seems to follow you around the internet. But um, AI will also help you do a simple Google search to help with the accuracy. So contrary to popular belief, Google doesn't just regurgitate every match on the internet. It's ranked and filtered based on your location, your search history. So it's really customized to you as a human being. A lot of these AIs make a constant and small impact on our lives, like keeping us engaged on social media apps a little bit longer, giving us convenience by showing us products that we like to buy and getting us from A to B a lot faster and avoid traffic. And these small conveniences are great, but AI can also have a much bigger lasting impact on our lives as well. When you submit an application to a bank for a loan, might be vehicle, mortgage, or whatever, it's an AI or a machine learning algorithm that determines whether your application is successful or not, and what, at what interest and how much of it to give you. And in our times with the pandemic, AI is actually also helping us discover new drugs and diagnose diseases. So AI has a huge impact on all of our lives. If we look at the market in terms of investments, and there's a lot of different studies that claim that the investment into AI by companies will double over the next four years. And if you couple that up with the huge increase in comput computational power that we have, it's allowing us to process huge amounts of data and try new innovative algorithms. It's really an exciting time to be a data scientist and work on AI. Next slide, please, Melissa. So Melissa and I both started our careers as data scientists. And in my opinion, it's one of the most dynamic jobs out there. And um, when I graduated, like, you know, a couple of years ago, <laughs> I have to admit that I wasn't super excited about getting into the work environment. In my mind, you know, I was going to be desk bound from like nine to five. And in my mind, work was just, you know, routine. It's about being a cog in the system, a brick in the wall. And, you know, those were the thoughts that were going on in my head. And I wasn't super optimistic about this next stage in my life. And I was like so extremely surprised in my experience and pleasantly because data science has been anything but routine. One reason is because it's always evolving. AI technologies, algorithms and techniques are constantly being created and updated. There's so much investment and research going to it, it's going to develop really fast. That means you'll be on the bleeding edge of technology. And to keep up, you're always going to be learning new things. Another reason is because data science and AI is multifaceted. There's a lot of different types of AI you can work on and a lot of different skills required to get it done. You will most likely work with a lot of different applications and tools to do this. So if you do decide to go into data science, there's a typical set of skills that you need to have as a data scientist, and we'll go through some of the fundamentals. So firstly, the foundation of every AI or analytics project is data. Before we can build any models or any report, for a matter of fact, we need to ensure the integrity and quality of data is good. And I personally can say that I have never, ever, ever receive data that is ready to go. There's always things to clean up, fix or transform in the data before I can actually use it to build my models. And if the data I get is somehow perfect, then you know there's alarm bells going off because I just know there's something has gone wrong. <clears throat> and typically you would be collecting data from a variety of different sources. For example, you, you may want to bring in social media data to supplement your demographic data. And once you have collected everything, you have to clean it. And other than the usual statistical methods you may apply, one of the key things you need to do at this stage is account for bias. If you use biased data, you're going to have biased models and make biased decisions. So bias is when we have a prejudice against certain things, people, and it can even be against ideas. 
And as humans, we all have bias, which means all the data that we have is biased to a degree because humans generated that data. And if we continue to use this data as it is, and we continue to make decisions on this data, all we're doing is perpetuating and amplifying the bias going, going forward. I remember seeing a clever, a clever tweet on Twitter that said, you know, AI can be money laundering for human bias, which is so true because if you don't use the right data, the AI will just take in all of that bias data, spit it out again. And if you don't look too closely, it'll seem like the AI is almost validating that bias data. So we need to be careful about ensuring that data is representative of reality. So does it reflect the actual demographics in terms of gender, race, age, et cetera? And also just because we have the data, should we use it? And this is a mistake a lot of data scientists make because they think the more data, the better. But should we actually use data points like your gender and race if we're making decisions regarding loan applications? You know, I don't think we should. There isn't a set of rules to prevent bias, which makes it a difficult problem, but it's really about critical thinking. Thinking about what you're doing and why you're doing it. And sometimes we're not able to rule out all the bias, but we need to do our best. And I think, you know, a best example of this was at the start of my career, we did a lot of analytics on survey data. And, you know, once we collected that data, we always weighted it to reflect the population of South Africa. But that data was still biased because all survey data is biased towards the kind of people who respond to surveys. So we, that was a problem that we didn't know how to tackle back then. But nowadays we have methods to actually predict what a person or customer would have responded to remove some of that bias. And only once your data is ready, do we move on to visualizations. Visualizations will help you understand the relationships and structure of your data to help you build better models. But more importantly, visualizations can help you communicate. So don't just think of visualizations as tools to understand the outliers and other things in the data, but as a tool to explain to your managers, your team members on what you're doing, what you want to do, or what the impact resulting from that will be. And how good your visuals are can be the determining factor of whether you get funding for your project or not, or whether you're recognized for your efforts. And this ability to visualize and tell a story is really an art. And I think it's really important, it's a really important skill for anyone to have, but for data scientists, it's you know, even more important because the nature of our work is very technical and we need to translate that in order to communicate properly. So if you've built a great AI model and you're able to create some beautiful visualizations that's convincing and tell your story, I believe you're gonna succeed. See it as a tool to deliver those insights you found and give people a sense of the impact that you've made. And after that, then there's the modeling stage, what data scientists call the fun stuff. You know, we call ourselves data scientists. And when the term first came out, a lot of people like debated, you know, but are you real scientists? And I believe the answer to that is a very obvious yes, because all industries have data scientists. If you think about it, we're in healthcare, we're in pharma, neurosciences, agriculture, Data scientists are everywhere these days. And similar to other sciences, there's actually a lot of experimentation that happens here too. It's crucial to success because we, we don't always know the insights and answers that are hidden within the data. And you do have to try different approaches to bring that out. There's many algorithms and approaches to try here and a lot of different applications. So we'll just name some of the major ones today. The most common form of AI is being used in organizations is machine learning. Machine learning is playing a part in any company you look at. It's basically algorithms that can receive data or input and use statistics to provide outcomes. It can identify patterns by itself on huge sets of data where humans would struggle and not be able to see all the indirect influences. So there's machine learning algorithms out there predicting what products we'll buy, if we're gonna pay our loans on time, and even how likely you are to crash your car next month and a lot more. 
There's also natural language processing that Melissa will speak about um, a little bit later, where the focus is to understand human language. Text data is unstructured, meaning it doesn't just sit in nice columns indicating you know, what value is related to what. It's one big sentence, or one big paragraph, and this type of data accounts for the majority of all the data we have, and it's growing even faster. So think about email, social media, and even call center interactions that's been transcribed using speech to text. And uh, Melissa will tell us um, how exactly that's being used and how it's done just now. We're also seeing more applications of computer vision where machines can identify objects and content of an image or video. Computer vision is one of the key components of the self-driving car because it needs to see the road, you know, pedestrians, other cars, obstructions, the robots, the road signs, and a whole lot more. And I will talk about that a little bit more later on as well. Okay, so now that you have an idea of what AI is and some of the different types of AI, we'll go into detail on natural language processing and computer vision since they're the more exciting newer types of AI being used in companies today. But before we do that, I just wanted to say again that there's a lot more different types of work you might encounter. We just named the foundations. You know, these are the must-have skills that you need. But um, you'll be doing a lot more than this. For example, at some stage, you're definitely going to have a hand in helping a company in the deployment of these models. You may even have to help with development of an app that will make use of these models and a whole lot more. Not to mention like all the different types of technologies that you're going to touch like Hadoop, Cloud, containers, Kubernetes. But these three pillars are the major themes. They're the foundation. And for, before we move on to the next um, section, it's time for our very first question. So question one, please remember to make sure that you send your answer to me in private chat. That way not everyone can see your answers and just copy you. In what year was the term AI coined? Okay, I'm also going to send this into the chat so you can have a look at it even after we've moved on from the slide. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to hand over to Melissa. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, so as Kelly mentioned, I'm going to be going a bit deeper into natural language processing. So what is natural language processing? It's a branch of artificial intelligence that gives machines the ability to interpret and understand human language. Kelly mentioned that currently text data is the largest um, form of our data source. And that makes sense because we are constantly um, on our phones. We are constantly sending text messages, emails, and social on social media. All of these um, mediums are producing large amounts of text data. Text data that might seem insignificant to some, but it's very valuable for organizations because at the end of the day, these are their customers speaking. Um, another portal that Kelly also mentioned was call centers. So being able to understand call center logs, what are common issues that customers are talking about, being able to transcribe those and then analyze that as well. The internet is making it even easier than before to um, generate this text data and digital records have now become a norm rather than an exception. If you think about it, anything that you can write out with a pen or type out on your keyboard can be considered unstructured text. So imagine giving a WhatsApp message to your computer to analyze. Without natural language processing, that information is completely, uh, completely meaningless to the machine. But with natural language processing, you're able to quickly sift through that um, text data and identify things like key topics. So what are people talking about? Emerging trends in the data, analyze things like the customer sentiment, how are they feeling about certain products? 
and also pick up things like correlation between um, different words and topics. Natural language processing is actually much more widespread than you may realize. Um, you use it in your everyday life. So for instance, Kelly mentioned earlier, when you um, need to spell a word, autocorrect is there, that's natural language processing in action. Um, when you're submitting an article or a thesis, in order to check if there's any copyright on it, um, a plagiarism checker is using natural language in the background, scanning through word for word of your document, putting content together and identifying any plagiarism in that document. Okay, so we interact with natural language processing all the time. Okay, so I'm just gonna give you a high level overview of the concept. It seems really um, cutting edge and cool and it is, but it's really easy to learn. Um, so this is just a high level process flow of what a document would need to go through before an algorithm can understand or analyze what's happening in, in the process. So the first step in the process is segmentation. And I'm going to go into each of these points in a bit more detail but you start off with your document and your document can be an article, a, a collection of articles or a bunch of different text comments. Um, and that can be your starting document. You would need to segment that into smaller pieces for the machine to understand it. You would then tokenize it. And this is just breaking it up into different words. You then do things like stop words to eliminate anything that's unnecessary in the document. We go through the process of stemming and lemmatization in order to bring words to their base form. Um, and then we tag it with our um, parts of speech and identify any named entities as part of that process. Okay, but we'll go into each of these. So the first one in this, in this process is segmentation. Um, so as I mentioned, with segmentation, you breaking that entire document up into sentence. And you can segment um, segments along the punctuations like your full stops or your commas, that's completely up to you. So in this example, I have one sentence and I've broken it up into two different um, segments. And I'm going to give each of these segments as smaller bits of the document for the machine to, to consume. Once I break those um, sentences up into segments, I will now tokenize it. With tokenization, what you're doing is you're breaking up those segments into keywords. Okay, again, you're taking it a level down and making it smaller bits for the machine to consume. Okay. Tokenization is really important for the next step, which is your stop words. Stop words are basically the process of getting rid of any non-essential words, which don't have any meaning in the sentence. They're just there to make it a proper sentence. Um, so words such as and, the, are, are considered stop words. In my sentence, my stop words was, is, was, and in. They don't add any meaning. Um, cricket invented in England is the main theme of my sentence. And that's what I would want my machine to analyze. The reason we remove these stop words is because they make, sh uh, they make processing slower. Um, they are often in the way and machines can interpret them as important. But if you apply a, these algorithms out there that allow you to remove this, um, and a lot of tools in SAS's case, for example, we have preloaded stop lists. So they automatically remove these words for you. Okay, so now I have my document in its raw form. I've segmented it into sentences across the different punctuations. I've then gone through the process of tokenization where I have actually broken up those sentences into words. Um, and then I've removed any unnecessary words from, from those tokens. My next step is to do um, stemming, okay? 
with stemming, all we're doing is we're explaining, um, explaining terms to the machine. So we start off by explaining words like scup, scups, and scupped are all the same word. They just have added prefixes or suffixes. This is stemming, and stemming is successful in most cases, um, but not always. Okay, so we're trying to explain to the machine you're looking at the exact same word, it's just different prefixes or suffixes. So we're kind of getting it back to the base word. Um, it works most times, but often um, you would need another level of um, analysis, and that's where um, lemmatization comes in. So with lemmatization, it's very similar to stemming. Um, but what happens is it's grouping together um, words with different inflicted forms um, of a word to the lemma, which is the base word over here. Okay, it's similar, as I mentioned, it's mapping several words into one common root word. But the main difference between stemming and lemmatization is that the output for the lemmatization is a, a proper word where with stemming, it's just prefixes or suffixes. Okay, the next step in the process is we need to do speech tagging. Okay, so with speech tagging, all we're basically doing is identifying the different um, parts of speech, and this is done in order to um, identify what this role of the word is in the sentence. Okay, and this is important because we're just explaining this to the machine. All right, and then once we've done our speech tagging, we need to do um, named entity tagging. And this is where we would introduce our machine to pop culture references and everyday names by flagging things like names of movies, important people, locations, dates, currency, etc. Okay, these are things that might occur in the document. Okay, so once we go through this entire process, we um, have our base words, we have words that are tagged, we use a machine learning algorithm on top of this process to teach our um, model to, hum to model um, human sentiment and speech. Okay, so so this is the base process you would go through before applying any machine algorithm, machine learning algorithm to your natural language process. You would have that raw form of your document. You would segment it into smaller sentences so that it's split according to the punctuations. Those sentences you would then take and create tokens, which is basically just further segmenting it into words you would then apply different stop words onto it. And all of those is basically just removing words that is completely unnecessary as part of your analysis. You then do stemming and lamentization. And all that is doing is matching words to its base word. And then you do parts of speech tagging where you say, okay, this word's a noun, a verb, et cetera, to identify the meaning and position of a particular word in a sentence. And then lastly, your named entity tagging, picking up things like currency, date, important names. So you're explaining that to the machine. Once all of that is done, you can then apply an algorithm um, on, on top of that um, problem. Okay, so that's just a high level overview of a typical NLP process. Um, these are the steps that you would usually go through before you do any of your machine learning algorithms to analyze that document. Okay. Melissa, before you move on, there was a question in the chat um, if computers are able to interpret, interpret emotions. Can, so can you speak a little bit about sentiment analysis? Sure, sure. So, so you would go through a process like this first, right? So you would go through all of this, it would break up words, identify correlations between words, um, and then 
it would do a score in order to determine uh, the sentiment analysis. So as part of the analysis, that would be the next step after this. It could be one of your problems that you're trying to solve, pick up customer sentiment or see how people are feeling. There are algorithms to do the scoring, but you would need to do this pre-process um, and it would provide a score and let's say the range, depending on what algorithm you use. If the range is below a certain value, it will say, okay, this, there's negative sentiment. If it's between um, of another value, it will say neutral. And if it's above, let's say 0 0.6 or 0 0.7 uh, probability or coefficient range, then it will be um, positive sentiment. Um, but what it's doing is it's scoring good words and bad words. And if there are more good words than bad words, then it's going to score it as positive. And if in the sentence there's more bad words than good words, it's going to score it as negative. Um, and if it's an equal amount, it will score it as neutral. But that's why you need to kind of go through this process so that you can break up those sentences or those documents into keywords for the computer to analyze and do the sentiment scoring. Um, and then we have another question about sure. sarcasm. Would that be a problem for a natural language processing model? So sarcasm is a it's a difficult one for sure to automatically um, to automatically detect. But there are loads of algorithms out there that are trained to detect sarcasm as well. Um, so again, same process. You would just use the algorithm in order to pick up if a person is being sarcastic. There's large data sets out there that are actually trained um, on on a data that's specifically um, picking up sarcasm. So you can just use those pre-trained algorithms to, to pick it up. Um, and then one more question. How does machine mm -hmm. learn named entity tagging? Sorry, how does? Machines learn named entity tagging. Okay. so. Again, this, this can be like a pre-configured algorithm to pick this up. So I'll talk about in the SAS context, context for instance, as part of our text analysis tool, there are pre-built algorithms in the background and it's picking up stuff like location, date and currency. And it's based on um, concept formatting. So like it will pick up a date format and identify those automatically. Same with currency. There's a pre-list of currency names and symbols that the algorithm is trained on. Um, and so when you run it against your, your data, it will automatically take, detect those. Cool. Um, and then we've got a couple of other questions. Um, so sure. the collection of data doesn't need to be English, so I can answer that really quickly for you. No, sure. it doesn't. Um, you know, these models, they support a very big variety of languages. Where we do mm -hmm. hit problems is, you know, when a language does not have a lot of speakers or it's not used a lot in business, then you might find that support for that language is lacking. And then also, interestingly, you know, if you mix languages, the models start to have a bit of problem. So, Melissa, you can tell everyone about that hilarious problem when you had it was mixed between English and Afrikaans and it was oh. really negative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, so I, and I'll share the use case a bit later, but I was working on a South African use case and some of the uh, text comments were in English and some of them were in Afrikaans. And a word that kept coming up as part of the analysis was die, die. So it was like negative sentiment all the way through. And I was like, oh my word, this is really bad. And then when I actually went to go investigate this comments, it was in Afrikaans and it was the word D instead of die. Um, so it, we had to separate those and analyze the Afrikaans document separate from the English documents because that's a, the problem that came up. And the last question on the chat is, can natural language processing detect a pun? Um, I haven't, I don't know Kelly, if you've had experience with it. I haven't had an, worked with an algorithm where it detected 
plans yet. I'm so I think sure. um so like all of these things you guys are mentioning, like let, let's bear in mind that we don't have general AI at the moment, right? General AI is good at lots of different things. So yeah. for example, I can create an AI that can like you know mimic a human basically. Yeah. Um, and if they know how to play checkers, then they know how to play chess. Right now, the AI that we have is very narrow. So narrow AI is good at doing one thing and one thing only. So if I train my AI to play checkers, it's not going to know how to play chess or anything else for a matter of fact, no matter how similar. It's just not going to know. It'll do one thing really great. So if you need an NLP to detect a pun, you need to have an AI behind that. It's, it's very task orientated. So in real life, you might not just be using one model. You might, yeah. You're not going to just use one model to analyze a paragraph. You might have multiple, one for puns, one for sarcasm, one, you know, I don't know, for swearing, and another one for content. So you, there's a lot of different models in the back end. It's not one AI performing everything. So you can build that. Yeah. Um, I think that would be, a, um, I think there's a couple of, of them out there that people are tinkering with. And then another question in the chat is about you know monitoring buildings using video, and I'm going to cover that a little bit later after the language part. Cool. Are there any? Language? Uh, that is it for now. Okay. All right. If there's any other questions, just let me know. Cool. Do. So that brings us to a, another question. So please remember to respond to Kelly directly. So the second question is, which of these natural language um, techniques is used in order to obtain words from sentences? So which technique is used to break those sentences up into words? Stemming, tokenization, lemmatization, or segmentation? We'll just give it a minute. Okay, Kelly, do you have the question in the chat? Can I move on? Yeah, yes, I do. It is in the chat. All right, great. Okay, so next we're going to work through a few um, real life applications of natural language processing. Uh, the first one I'll take you through is chatbots. I'll explain how the different um, different types of chatbots, the various applications for chatbots, and then again the typical process flow for chatbot development. Then we'll go through um, a speech to text use case covering specifically um, what the process is to transfer your data from speech to text. Um, and then lastly, through a topics detection use case, we'll show you how key topics and themes can be detected in text data. Okay, so we'll start off with chatbots. So even if you haven't ever held a conversation with Siri or Alexa, you've likely encountered a chatbot online somewhere. Um, so often when you're on a website and you open it up for the first time, you'll see that little chat um, box in the right hand corner pop up saying, thank you for visiting our site. How can I help you today? Well, this is a chatbot. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to proactively uh, promote customer engagement on the site. So they're trying to help you and navigate you through their website so that you stay engaged. Um, but before we get into any of these applications of chatbot, there's two primary types of chatbots that's used in business. And I just wanna give you a high level overview of that. Um, the two is a transactional chatbot and conversational chatbots. So Transactional chatbot is a pre-designed chatbot and it provides customers with a fixed set of choices. So a customer can select an option that is relevant to what they want to do or whatever problem it is they want to solve. Once a customer selects a specific choice, the chatbot will guide them through the process by providing them more options um, until the question is answered or until the problem is solved. This kind of transactional chatbot is um, really great for businesses like restaurants, online delivery services, or even banks who kind of know in advance what it is that uh, their customers may require. The second type of chatbot that is very prominent in business is the conversational chatbot. This one, on the other hand, is designed uh, specifically to understand and respond um, with conversation in a human-like manner. And in order to do this, the chatbot is equipped with artificial intelligence. 
it also has to have access to the background data, other information, um, analytics in the background, reports, etc., so that it can be contextually aware. Okay. Once it is contextually aware, it can pick up um, variations in customers' questions, queries, and response, and then give the relevant answer in a human-like manner. Okay. So now that we know these two different types of chatbot, these are some real-life applications for chatbots. So chatbots are really popular in the customer support um, and customer service area um, because they're really good at um, holding customer engagement. So some of the use cases within that space is to answer frequently asked questions. So in most businesses, 80% of the customer queries that are, um, are being asked are made up of only a few questions that customers are asking repeatedly. Um, so a, these questions are quite simple and easy to answer. So you can easily put a transactional bot there to answer any of these questions and um, have, have the bot handle those issues. Um, sorry, can I ask, I think it's, I don't know, Kelly, is it to you or someone in the chat that if you can just mute, please. I hear vigorous typing. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And then the second type of um, application for chatbots in the customer service space is um, to resolve any queries. So answering questions is helpful, but a chatbot is um, not that useful if it doesn't have information on the complete transaction. So for example, if a customer um, frequently calls to check on delivery time, um, you can have a bot handle that. In order for the bot to have that type of information, again, the bot would need to be equipped. So this is more of a conversational bot. They would need to be equipped with information like the tracking data behind the scenes, etc. So they would need direct contact with the databases so that they can retrieve the latest data to give the customer the correct answer. Um, another application within the customer service space is in order to redirect customers to the um, correct, uh, sorry, to the correct support teams. So um, there are some issues that chatbots won't be able to solve, of course, they therefore basic help and in order to speed up that engagement. But if an issue is too complex to solve, the chatbot can um, assign the customer to a human agent to help them resolve any queries. Um, we, there was also a study done and it showed that 86% 80, of customers actually wanted this option and preferred this option. So if they felt like the issue was too difficult or they no longer wanted to engage with the bot, they wanted to be able to easily transfer to a human agent and that is possible as well. Bots are also super useful in the marketing space. So um, one use case is to recommend new offers. So as the bot is chatting to a customer, they can make offer recommendations based on the customer's verbal feedback. So if there's any keywords that the bot is detecting, um, they can use those keywords as an input for an analytics model in the background to make the right next best offer for the customer. So again, integrating with data, integrating with analytics in the background to make sure that the bot is providing the best uh, service for the customer. Um, another way that it's great in the marketing support space is in order to understand the customer. So the, this bot can be configured with the type of uh, questions that uh, the business might need. And the bot can ask the right questions at the right time on an application or on a website. All of this information is being uh, retrieved um, and being stored so that we have a good understanding of our customer base. Collecting customer feedback, again, as I mentioned, bots are constantly collecting data um, and customer feedback is one of the sources of data that they will be collecting. So if there's any complaints or queries, um, that data can be collected and stored and then analyzed at the latest stage in order to make sure that we are improving 
um, service or quality so that we can improve conversion rates because that's the ultimate goal. Um, businesses can um, also store conversions and identify any um, insights from these complaints. Again, this is integrating that live data stream with analytics that we can use in order to make sure that uh, you're offering your customer the best possible services. So for example, if there's an issue around delivery that customers are complaining about all the time, then a business would know, okay, we need to work on our delivery services because this is an issue that comes up all the time. But that data is being collected by a bot. Okay. In the sales space, um, a bot can be used as a sales assistant. So similar to things like um, Alexa and Siri, which are assistant bots, you can also use a chat bot within a sales organization um, and use that bot as a sales assistant. So the bot can do stuff like um, let salespeople know when a new opportunity has been assigned to them. They can do stuff like um, simplify lead creation and updates so they can take over a lot of the tedious work that the salesperson would go through and automatically kind of notify them. Um, within the sales space, you can also do a lot of selling and marketing on um, text only channels. So you can deploy your chatbots to um, your social media accounts, for example, including WhatsApp or Facebook, etc. Um, in order to attract customers. So I know an example of this was Domino's Pizza. They launched a bot on Facebook Messenger and they called it the Pizza Bot. And basically what this bot allows customers to do is uh, quickly order pizza. So they could just put in the pizza emoji or the words and they would start or kick off that ordering process. Um, and the idea of this is our customers are on Facebook, our customers are constantly on WhatsApp. So let's take our service to where our customers are um, and just making it much more convenient for um, the customer to do that. So instead of having to go out of your social media accounts and go onto the Domino's app, you can quickly engage with Domino's from that Facebook Messenger bot. Okay. Another one is um, leads nurturing, for example, within a sales organization. So being able to communicate with the customer at every single um, stage of the sales cycle, um, keeping them informed about the products, checking in and helping them with any questions that they might have. Um, the bot basically will listen to the customer's need and then provide the relevant information and answer any questions that they need so that the customer constantly feels supported throughout the entire sales process. Okay, so these are just a few examples of where chatbots can be used, but the possibilities is endless. If you think about it anywhere where you possibly have a question that can be answered, there is a platform for a chatbot to be used. Okay, so just before um, I, let's just move on. So before you start anything, um, you want to be able to identify what it is that you want your bot to do. Okay, you need to identify all the required features, all of the possible questions you want your bot to address. Um, and doing a process like this upfront will ensure that you have a robust chat box. Um, and ideally one that can deal with most topics, but you also need to think about what if my bot can't answer a question? What then, what is the strategy to handle those unknown questions? Okay, so when you start off with a chatbot process flow, those are the kind of questions you need to kind of ask yourself. And then you start off actually designing and building that bot. Okay, but it starts off with the planning phase. What questions do I want them to deal with? What topics do I want the bot to deal with? And then how do I want the bot to handle situations where they cannot answer the question? Okay, so once you've done all of that planning, you would go through the process of developing your bot. The first step in the process is you need to create a dialogue. 
And all a dialogue is, it's basically those topics and questions or conversational topics that you want the bot to be speaking about. You would design the dialogue, design um, how you want the bot to cover different aspects of it. Um, and then you would add content. And as I mentioned, you can integrate your bot to your data sources, you can integrate your bot to your reports, and you can integrate your bot to your analytics. So adding those types of content or external links, et cetera, doesn't matter what the content is, but adding the content um, to the bot is what, give it, what gives it its context. You can also add things like um, small talk. And basically this ensures that your bot is polite so that the engagement is as pleasant as possible. So I create my dialogue, which is my conversational flow identifying the topics that the bot's going to talk about. I then add content to that um, topics in those dialogues. And I add small talk in order to make sure that um, the experience is as human-like as possible. So for example, I designed a bot and the customer wanted the bot to say, thank you after every interaction. So that the bot can say, thank you. Is there anything else I can help you with? Or hope you have a great day further. So that's the type of small talk you want to add to your bot as well. Next, you need to identify as part of your dialogue, what is your triggers? And triggers are basically things like what's kicking off the conversation, um, what is redirecting the conversation to a different topic or dialogue, um, and Another trigger could be, okay, um, this is the way that the customer will be redirected to a live agent if we can't answer the question. So those are all the kinds of triggers. Starting off the conversation, redirecting the conversation to a different topic, or even redirecting the conversation to a live agent. Okay, so you would need to um, add those triggers throughout your journey as well. Um, so bot designing, you can think of it as like a really complex like tree map because you would have a wide range of topics and each topic will have a different process flow. Okay, once you've done all of this, you've created those process flows, you've identified the topics, added the content and the small talk, identified the triggers in your process flow, you want to be able to test that bot, okay? And testing the bot simply means you want to make sure that the bot is um, conversational. So you want to test that the flow is correct, that the triggers are performing as you expect, et cetera. Okay. So this is a typical process that you would go through um, for your bot development. Do you have any questions before I move on to the second use case? Nothing on the chat, Melissa. Okay. If anything comes up, we can address them. All right. The second use case is um, speech to text. So with speech to text capabilities, what it does is it enables the recognition of human language. And then what it does is once it's detected that human language, it does a translation from speech format into text format. Okay. Only once your audio file has been translated into text format, would you apply natural language processing to do stuff like information extraction, analyzing any patterns or doing any further analysis of that textual data. Okay, so the first step would be you go through that natural language processing um, process flow that I spoke about earlier, but before you do that, you do the actual transcription from speech to text. Okay, so the process begins with a um, process called feature extraction. And basically what this is doing is the machine is breaking up the audio file into short frames. Again, it's kind of doing that segmentation that I spoke about earlier. It's breaking it up into little frames of audio and then doing the analysis. Okay, once it's broken it up into smaller frames, it's then applying an acoustics model, which is um, predicting the alignment between the sound and an actual letter associated with the sound. Okay, 
So now we've taken those features and we're associating it with um, letters. All right, and then what, what you then do is you take the outputs from the acoustic model and you feed it into a language model, which uses natural language processing to translate those values into um, words or phrases, okay? So the acoustic model scores the computed audio features and then the language model um, decodes that, um, de decodes those and scores those audio features. Okay, and it's transcribing those scored numbers into actual text. So in other words, the acoustic models outputs um, show us how the machine comprehends each part of the audio, um, which is in a numeric form, as you can see there. And then the language model outputs the text transcriptions. Okay, the language model will also give you a variety of different outputs for the text transcriptions and then give you a probability score of which one is most likely and select the most likely one. So in this case, hello world is the most likely one and that's what it's going to output. Okay, so that's the process of speech to text. Speech to text is also often used together with chatbots. So um, often you having a conversation with a bot instead of typing out, which is what occurs on an online platform, but when you are conversating with a bot, it's translating that speech to text, and then it's analyzing, it can take that data and analyze it further if there's any analytics that need to be applied, for example. <coughs> Melissa, we have a question. Sure. Uh, Sipo asked if the acoustic model can pick up when a person is angry by the volume. Um, I can answer this really quickly. So sure. the quick answer is yes, and it's actually, there's some really cool um, implementations where we can even detect when the customer is very irate and is constantly interrupting mm -hmm. the um, call center agent. So there are models that can um, pick that up as well. Cool. Were there any other questions? No, they are not. Okay. Cool. So we'll move on to our next use case, which is the topics detections use case. So with this use case, this is the use case I was mentioning earlier. I worked together with a um, UJ PhD student actually, and he was analyzing a large amount of um, protest data. So the data was actually comments from um, riot police so when they're on the site, they would take a pen and a paper and they would write down a comment or a report based on a protest that is happening live. This data was then collected into a database and analyzed. So the purpose of the study was we wanted to identify what were the root causes of protests? Why were people protesting? Um, what were they protesting about, et cetera? So there were three steps in this analysis. The first thing we did was we had to do um, descriptive analysis report. So we basically broke up all the information according to the different regions or provinces. And then we actually built out a taxonomy um, and all the taxonomy was, it was identifying these are the keywords or topics we wanna look for in the data. Um, and then we had subcategories and sub subcategories, et cetera. So there were 102 uh, unique categories as part of the text model, or if you think of categories, just think about it as the topics that we wanted to pick up. There were 102 unique topics we wanted to detect in this text data. Um, and we created those categories to detect those keywords. Um, and then lastly, we put the words together and we built out an analytics model in order to classify protesting. So there were three levels of classification while protest violent, disruptive, or peaceful, okay? So we use those keywords as an input for our analytics modeling at the end to do the classification of process, of protest, sorry. Um, for the output of this project, we got like a high view of what the nature of pro protest were. And this was done a few years ago. I think it was 2019 or 2018. 
um, within those two years we did this project. So that's the context of when these results are from. But we wanted to identify what the nature of, of protest were. And we found that like 86% of protests were actually just peaceful. So there was no violence, there was no um, vandalization or anything. So most protests were actually peaceful. We found that labor related process, the main cause of it was due to management and not wages, which we thought was other way around. We thought when people were protesting labor issues, it was mostly because of um, money, but actually it was because of management. Um, we found that pro um, courtside protests actually played a very important role um, in the landscape of direct political action. And we found that the profile for grievances across the different provinces was very similar to the political profile across, across the provinces. So um, the, pro the grievances in Gauteng were different from that in the Western Cape. And the political issues that were happening in Gauteng were different from that in the Western Cape, for example. So they matched each other. Um, but they were different across provinces, if that makes sense. And so this was a really cool project to be a part of. Um, yeah, so this is one way that analytics together with um, natural language processing was used in order to identify those key topics in a bunch of different text data. Um, and then we actually applied an analytical model to classify the nature of the protest. Um, yeah, so this is one one of the projects. Cool. So I um, I don't know if there's any questions at this point. I don't see any on the chat. Um, if you guys have questions, you can always type it in whenever we can address them right at the end. Sure. Okay. I'm then going to hand over to Kelly, who will take you through the computer vision use cases. Thanks, Melissa. Um, computer vision is, you know, my favorite type of AI. It's really exciting and there's a lot of things happening in here, but essentially it's using machines to understand, analyze and extract inf information from image data. So it's essentially teaching machines to see. Computer vision the concept is also not new, but recently we've seen a huge increase in successful computer vision applications and interest in this technology once again, because, you know, computer vision requires a lot more processing power due to the nature of the algorithms behind them, the convolutional neural networks. And the recent advancements in processing power has really made computer vision a lot more accessible and easier to run. A lot of these um, convolutional neural networks are being run on GPUs. So if you're a gamer, you'll be familiar. And that's maybe one of the reasons why there's such a shortage in uh, GPUs on the market at the moment. But there's three main tasks that computer vision and artificial intelligence can perform. Uh, first one being image classification, which is about classifying an entire image into categories, basically attaching a label or multiple labels, in fact, to an entire image. So, for example, um, if there's a cat in that image, you can classify it as a cat. Um, object detection is about identifying the location of an object inside an image. So essentially taking that step um, one step further to actually show you exactly where it is by drawing a bounding box. Image segmentation improves on that idea and it's a pixel level classification where each pixel is assigned to a class and thus results into a mask. So instead of just um, a, a rectangular box, you actually have exactly a, a pixel level location of where that object resides in an image. Image classification is the type we encounter the most because all we need are photos or frames from a video to train these models. Remember I said earlier, you know, no data is clean and you might be thinking, well, you know, it's an image. But surprise, you still have that problem here because this data needs to be tagged and treated. Because with object detection and image segmentation, you need the training data or the training images to actually already have those bounding boxes or uh, pixels tagged. So someone manually has to go in and draw those boxes or like even worse, tagging each pixel to show the different segments. And as you can imagine, it can get very time consuming and tedious. 
Personally, I've done the uh, manually tagging of bounding boxes. I cannot absolutely imagine like having to go onto a pixel level to do this. And um, some of the data is indeed collected and prepared this way, but there's other methods too. So on the next slide, you'll see some something that you might find familiar. Melissa? Sometimes, you know, when you're logging into a website and they present you with a bunch of pictures like this, a capture program to prove that you're human. So guess what you're doing? You're helping them tag or confirm tags to help build their image recognition neural networks. So you have all been training an AI without even knowing about it. Google collects this data to improve their functions like, you know, more accurate image searches or more accurate map results. And you know how you can search photo libraries with words like dog or sea or ocean that's also powered by image recognition and you by tagging you know those street signs is actually helping a driverless car out there be safe next slide please melissa and depending on what problem you're trying to solve you would need to choose a type of computer vision and i will share with you at a high level what SAS is doing with each of the three. So first one being image classification or labeling data is useful when you need to make a decision about an entire image. We have this really cool data for good initiative where our AI platform is analyzing and making sense of thousands of satellite images on a continued basis to show and identify magnitude of damage in the rainforests. So essentially, it'll just bring in all of those um, satellite images and it'll determine, you know, here they're seeing some damage here or they're seeing some human activity and they, they will alert the authorities to go and investigate. But AI can't do it alone because it needs training data. And you can actually help us identify signs of deforestation that the model has learned to detect. So if you, if you participate, whether you identify deforestation in one image or 100 images, it's going to allow us to fine tune our AI models so that we can detect change in the Amazon and alert conservation and government organizations who are responsible for protecting it. With the next one, object detection, it was really useful in a project that we implemented at the SAS Rome offices. It was actually quite simple. We just put up a camera in one of the windows um, out, uh, looking out from the office to identify the current state of traffic. So the AI would first identify all the cars in a video stream and total up all the cars that it saw, but in real time. So this provided a real time update on the traffic conditions for our SAS employees and you know they can access it on a dashboard and see wow traffic looks really bad. They would rather come in on a bicycle or public transport and that they weren't going to drive. And the last one image segmentation has really been useful in the healthcare and medical industry. It's useful at looking at medical scans and segmenting a tumor or a lesion, for example, and it can give you very accurate information about how of its changes in size and shape. And this picture that you're seeing is actually a biopsy of a kidney. SAS recently collaborated with the University of Cambridge to use computer vision models to score biopsies for kidneys to better select kidneys for transplant. So it would automatically look at that biopsy and look at the candidate who is going to receive that kidney and provide a match. And, and that was really useful because a lot of times these new kidneys would fail or the kidneys weren't of high quality and they knew how to prevent that. But on the next slide, you'll see that uh, regardless of the um, computer vision project that you're selecting, there's three main steps in order to deliver it. First, we need data once again, but this can be in the form of photos, a video or 3D scans, and we need to collect enough data. Very often people ask me, you know, um, how many pictures do I need to, do, to build one of these? There, there isn't really an exact number, but the rule of thumb is about a thousand per class. So, for example, if you're identifying um, faces, let's say, just to identify any sort of human face within a picture, you would need about a thousand. If you're identifying cats and dogs, you would need a thousand of each, so two thousand in total. Once you have your images, then we need to process the data. 
And this includes the things we already mentioned, like tagging, drawing, drawing those bounding boxes and uh, labeling. But depending on what you're trying to do, you might have a whole range of image processing to do. For example, um, we, spoke about, we spoke about a use case with one of our customers about monitoring crop growth from satellite images. So they want to be able to see how the crops are doing. But what happens when there's clouds blocking the view? And there's always some cloud somewhere. What you need to do is process and remove those clouds before you actually make an assessment. If you're using computer vision to identify damage, let's say, on a car, so a customer just crashed their car and you want to be able to see how bad the damage is, you might change resolution, you might remove colors and apply a lot of different filters so that only the edges are visible. Because sharp edges and a lot of edges usually mean that something is broken or smashed. So it's really depending on what you're trying to do. You need to get a little bit creative and see if that helps the AI see a little bit better. Once it's done, we can build out image recognition models. I'm not going to go into all the technical details or the architecture of a, of a convolutional neural network, but I just want to make the point and mention that you don't actually need to go and build everything from scratch. You don't need to design that neural network layer by layer. There are a lot of great pre-trained neural networks that you can grab and use and then refine from them. So for example, the tiny YOLO is a really uh, popular one. So what you do is you use that pre-trained model that already has some intelligence and you just, you know, make a couple of tweaks, refine it a little bit better for your particular use case. All right, and once again, it's time for the next question. I will also pop it into the chat. So for question three, if I want to build an AI to count the number of oranges in a tree, which is actually one of the use cases that we've encountered for um, an agriculture customer who, you know, they don't want to have to manually go out there and have a look at all their orchards and stuff. What type of computer vision should I use? I'm going to just give you a quick minute to send me your answers. Okay, I see the answers are trickling in. If you've missed um, the question, it is also in the chat. But for now, we're going to move on to use cases on the next slide. So let's have a look at how it's being used by our SaaS customers in a few more industries. And one of the great places to implement computer vision is actually in retail. Have you ever stood in a line at a grocery store and you know this line is so long and it's moving so slowly and you're just wondering why there are only two tills open? And retailers are aware of this fact, but sometimes it's unrealistic for the store manager to be constantly changing staff rosters and timetables to meet that need. With computer vision, we can identify automatically the flow of traffic coming into the store. And as we build up that uh, data flow of customers, we can start to forecast uh, customers into the future. With that forecast, we can uh, optimize how many workers should be on duty at the tills so that we are better prepared. So it's basically planning your workforce a little bit better, but we're using AI and specifically computer vision to collect data. But we can even set up cameras to monitor the lines at the tills to alert the managers to make changes when the lines are too long or if the lines are not moving. So we can prepare for the future, but also in real time, we can make we can have a full view of the situation within the store. We can also identify the typical paths that the customers take when they're in the store and where they spend the most time. This is really helpful to plan your store layout. So do you ever wonder why like all the things you need are on opposite sides of the store? They actually do that on purpose to keep you in that store a little bit longer, to have you walk past products um, that they want you to buy so that you have a higher likelihood of taking in more things into your cart. So with this information, they can do that a bit better. And um, they can also identify where is the best place to 
put their merchandise that they want you to um, have a look at, maybe new products or products on special, because now they know how the traffic flows. But it's not just for physical retailers, but online too. For example, fashion retail is a great place for computer vision, because if you think about it, the nature of fashion is visual. And traditionally, fashion retailers would tag their products manually, like a skirt, black, short, but you know, it can be sorted and categorized when we do this tagging and that when we do a search, we, we can actually find it. But there's, if there's a lot of products, it can become very overwhelming so quickly. But nowadays we can do this with computer vision automatically. It doesn't just save time, but it also enables a lot of other things like image searches. And this is a cool one because, you know, once you have that in place, this means that like I can upload a photo of a celebrity that I like in an outfit that I want, and it can automatically bring up products for me to copy that look. Virtual try-ons are also getting a lot of attention because of the pandemic and people don't want to go into stores if possible. And it's also powered by computer vision. Insurance is also leveraging AI to exp expedite a lot of processes. As consumers, we now have very high expectations of how fast service should be. You know, when I see a product that says this product ships in five to seven days, I just don't buy it. I want it shipped tomorrow and in my hands the next day. And our expectations aren't just contained within, you know, the one industry, for my example, it would be retail, but it starts to leak and permeate throughout all aspects of our lives. And it's also influencing us in what we want from other industries like banking and insurance. If for insurance, you know, I don't want to talk to someone for 30 minutes just to get a quote. And if I submit a claim, I'm not waiting two weeks to get paid out. And, you know, if I have to send an email to ask for feedback, you know, that's already a bad experience. I don't want to have to send that email. And the insurers know this, and they're using a lot of AI to meet those expectations. So let's think of one for a um, computer vision example. So typically when you submit a claim, so let's say I've just recently had an accident and there's like this whole process to follow to determine how bad the damage is, if they're going to pay, and they can either send out an assessor to come and have a look at the car, or they'll tell you to take it somewhere to get an assist. And that takes time to coordinate. They have to find an available slot in the person's schedule, etc. But some insurers are actually beginning to use AI to do all of that. So if one of their customers have an accident, they can immediately log the claim on their app and they just need to take photos of the damage from all directions. The AI will have a look at these photos and assess how bad the damage is and the cost to repair it. So that removes a huge part of the process. You, know, you don't have to send someone manual or ask the customer to take it somewhere. And if your damage is small, maybe superficial damage to the shell, they can even resolve it immediately. So that payout can come in real time once you submit it. And an unexpected benefit to this is that now the AI has a view of every single claim that it's processed. It can detect fraudulent claims based on the image. So some fraudsters are going to use the same car damage for multiple claims. But um, there was a really funny fraud um, syndicate where they took one bump, damaged bumper and they would attach that bumper to different cars and then do a claim. So the AI was actually able to detect from the damage pattern, like, hey, wait a minute, I've seen this damaged bumper before. It looks exactly like this one. And it was actually able to detect that this was a fraudulent claim. And this is impossible for a human because, you know, even if a human has looked at every single picture, it's unable to actually make those connections and say, I've seen this kind of damage somewhere else and flag it as fraud. And when I talk about this particular use case, a lot of, you know, car fanatics, they would say, okay, but you're only looking at the outside. What about damage inside? It might look like a small bump on the front, but the actual radiator is busted. The AI actually is able to pick up that certain locations or certain um, bumps in very specific places can mean a bigger um, claim amount and it can automatically assign the correct amount to that and it's actually really, really accurate. 
And on the next one, I also just wanted to mention, um, it's not an industry, it's just another use case that is very fast developing. Image captioning is like merging computer vision and natural language together. It's a process of automatically generating text to describe images. Because a picture really conveys ideas and context a lot better than words do. So let's say I've got this picture in the back end and um, I'm going to apply image classification to it. And image classification says car. What are you guys thinking? Like imagine this picture in your head, photo of a car. If I take it a little bit further and I use a object detection model, and it's telling me four cars. Now, I don't know about you, but I could be thinking about a parking lot, a garage. Next, if I use a simple image captioning model and it outputs many cars on a road, you might be thinking it's a photo of a street, you know, cars driving on a highway you guys have this idea in your head, then let's have a look at what this photo actually is. I'm sure the majority of you weren't thinking of F1 type racing, right? And as a human, if I looked at this photo, I would probably say something like this. F1 cars racing around a corner. So this task is super simple for humans. You could probably show a picture to a five-year-old and they would probably come up with a fairly good description of what they see. But it's actually really difficult to replicate this in machines, but we are making good progress in this area. Next slide, please, Melissa. One of, the fav my, one of my favorite applications of this technology is in a form of an app that is available for free to download. And what it does is it helps blind people navigate the world. The app uses your camera on your phone and it will verbally describe what it sees. So it's really helpful to blind people if they need to read a label on a grocery that they want to buy. They can identify colors of clothes. But, you know, my favorite is they can actually sit in a park and hear descriptions of the environment, which I just think is so beautiful. And I wanted to end on this particular use case because I feel that it's the perfect example of how AI can improve human lives. Very often people worry about AI taking jobs and replacing humans, but you know, as organizations are adopting AI, we've begun to see that this is not the case. What it does do is it changes the way we work. And on the flip side, AI and data science have actually helped create jobs too. Humans and machines are good at very different things. Machines are much more efficient at repetitive tasks and processing and identifying patterns at huge scale and speed. So let's leave the heavy lifting to machines and allow humans to focus on what we're good at, creativity, innovation, and applying our experiences and applying judgment calls on top of the AI to make those decisions. Because ultimately, AI will still require human supervision and input to make sure its objectives are correct and that it's fair and it's unbiased. AI can really make a positive impact on our world and it enables us humans to maximize our impact and unlock more of our potential. So if you feel like this is something you want to do, Melissa is going to show you exactly how you can become a data scientist in the next section. Thanks, Kelly. Okay. So if you've ever Googled how to become a data scientist, you'll see that there's a wealth of information listing a bunch of technical skills that you need in order to be a data scientist. So while these are super important, um, if you really want to succeed as a data scientist, you also need to ensure that you have the right set of soft skills too. So these soft skills together with that um, technical skills is what will make you a successful data scientist. Kelly touched on a high level on some of those technical skills at the beginning when she was talking about the data curation, the visualization, the modeling, and some of the applications that apply to that. Um, but I'm just gonna talk you through a few um, soft skills 
that you can use as part of your um, skill set as a data scientist. So the first one is storytelling and communication. So on a lot of um, job postings for data scientists, this is a skill that's actually a requirement. Um, it doesn't matter how great your technical skills are. If you aren't able to communicate with others well, you're gonna find it really difficult um, in delivering true value. So for example, if you have a model that you as a data scientist build, it's a really cool model and you put it into production, you need to be able to communicate across different teams. So you need to be able to talk to the data engineering team to make sure that there is solid data in the pipeline. You need to be able to communicate your model to the software engineer teams in order to make sure that you get the expected input so that your model can deliver value. You will also need to communicate um, successfully to stakeholders, both during your model development phase and also once your model is actually in production, once it's being used. Um, you will find that you have to be able as a data scientist to communicate to a broad range of people with different skill sets, both technical people as well as non-technical people. So um, Kelly mentioned earlier even, you can create an amazing AI model and have it ready to go. But if you aren't able to communicate the value that this um, model will bring to the business organization, so speaking business language, um, you won't get funding for that project. So um, it's all good to build the model, but you need to be able to communicate across the organization, technical and non-technical. Okay, another soft skill that is extremely important to have as part of your skill set is business acumen. So unless you're working as a data scientist in academia, business ac um, acumen is actually extremely important skill for you to develop. Um, in business, everything comes down eventually to profit. So as a data scientist in business, your primary role will be to deliver value from the data that the company is capturing. You will need that business acumen in order to determine which projects you should be applying data science to and which you shouldn't. So where should I even use AI and where is it maybe not necessary to use AI? You will need to also determine uh, different ways to measure the performance of your models. Um, and that's not just from a fit statistic point of view, but from a financial point of view and communicate again that to the business. So if you think about the data scientists perform double duty kind of, not only must you know your own field and how to navigate data, but you must also know the field of business and how things work within the particular business or industry that you are a data scientist in. Okay. For critical thinking, which is the next skill that I think is extremely important for every data scientist to have, I think this needs to be um, a part of your makeup. So you need to be able to analyze questions, analyze results, and have that critical thinking in order to, to solve problems quickly. Um, you need to be able to look at problems from different viewpoints and different perspectives. Um, and critical thinking is also a really valuable uh, skill that's easily transferred to whatever profession you decide to go into. For data scientists, it's even more important because in addition to finding insights, you'll need to uh, be able to appropriately frame questions and understand how results uh, relate to business and drive next steps, and then take that information and actually translate it into into actions. Okay, so you need to understand how your work, your models, how do they actually um, apply? What's the next steps that need to happen? And then you need to be able to, to see the long term and communicate that um, into action. Okay. Next, we have problem solving as a, as a um, soft skill as well. So as a data scientist, you need to be able to identify opportunities, but also explain um, 
problems and solutions with your problem solving skills. So using, um, using this attrib attribute, uh, data scientists will have the know-how to kind of approach problems and identify any existing assumptions and resources um, that they have. You can't really be, become a data scientist or start your data scientist journey without the desire to want to solve problems because that's precisely what data science is. You need to be an effective problem solver. You need to have a desire to want to dig into the root cause of an issue and be able to um, try and identify ways to solve that issue. Okay, but that innate desire to want to solve problems is extremely important for any data scientist. Okay, and then the final soft skill um, is curiosity. So as a, as, a, as a data scientist, you need to be intellectually uh, curious. So you need to always want to um, search for answers, dive deeper into things. Again, that comes with digging for that root cause. And then um, you need to be able to challenge results. Um, and that's part of your curiosity. Um, curiosity enables creativity. And it's what allows us as data scientists to constantly ask those why questions because one answer is just not enough. So we always asking why. If a statement is made, it's why, because we always want to get deeper to the root cause. Um, we always want to have as much information as possible because the more information we have, the, um, the better our work becomes because it's more informed. Okay, so as a data scientist, you must be intellectually curious um, and dive into the questions. You um, innately, to be a successful data scientist, you never settle for just enough. You're always asking why and always hunting for, for more answers and more information. Okay, Kelly, I don't know if there's anything you wanna add in your experience with regards to soft skills in the field of data science. Um, I think one of the biggest things is that um, people often want to classify you as an introvert or an extrovert. And, you know, if you're like in sciences or engineering and, you know, they perceive you as like the super clever person, they're going to want to classify you as an introvert. But I often find that firstly, it's not just two clear buckets, right? It's very often a sliding scale and at different times we could be very different. And even if you do feel like you're an introvert, communication and the ability to you know, present your findings, it's, it's really not that tied down to your personality. See it as a skill that you can learn. So it really doesn't matter if you're a shy person or you're more reserved, you can learn that skill. So don't be discouraged. Yeah, yeah, agree 100%. So just to share from my personal experience as well, I'm naturally full on on the introvert spectrum. Um, and I was all about being a techie, working in the background, and I ended up in a customer facing role. And even if you're not in a literal customer facing role, you have customers in your organization all the time. So your customer can be your manager or a supporting team function. And these are all people that you need to be able to communicate with. So it's, if it feels uncomfortable at the beginning, um, I would say, that's good because that's where we grow. I 100% believe you grow outside of your comfort zone. Um, so applying these skills are super important, even if it's not comfortable at first, it eventually um, it starts becoming kind of part of your everyday life. And then it becomes more comfortable as time passes for sure. Okay. So these are just some of the soft skills. Um, but yeah, so before we go on to the next section, we have another question. So which skills drive data scientists to ask the why question? Select the most uh, correct answer. So is it business acumen, curiosity, communication, or problem solving? Give you a few minutes, um, remember to- While, you, while we're on the quiz, there was uh, two questions on the chat. Um, the first one is, since data can be compromised and violated, what can we do to protect against that? 
So of course, you know, there's all those um, regulations that specify how you can use data. So like Poppy, I'm sure you guys have all received some form of Poppy email on the 1st of July. And there's also other ones like GDPR. So we always have to make sure the reason if you're using that data, there's a very good reason and we have the permissions to do that. So data scientists do need to be aware of what data they can use and what they can't use. Um, and then the second one was between data science and data management, which one should come first? So within data science, there is a data management component, um, uh, primarily in the form of data curation. So every single data scientist should know how to curate data. By curate data, it's the collection, it is the um, transformation, it's, that, uh, it's about getting data ready for a model. In terms of data management, I personally see it as a separate discipline because there's professions where you only primarily focus on data management. So that's ensuring the back end systems that collect data is working correctly, that um, data, metadata is updated, uh, that people have access to the right data sets. And if there's sensitive data like ID numbers, that those are masked correctly. So it is a little bit, it's a bit separated. You can either go into data science or data management. You might be a data scientist that have the background knowledge or some skills in data management, but I inherently see it as um, it's, a, it's a slightly different um, profession. Data management comes with its own very big, large domain of technology that they need to use and also a different set of skills to data scientists. Agreed. I but there is I definitely agree. a bit of overlap between the two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. I think I missed the point of the question. Which one should come first? Oh, the answer. <laughs> data management. <laughs> data management should come first, of course. Yes. Um, yes. You know, if you're a data scientist going into an organization and they don't have a data management team, you're really going to have a bad time. Yeah, yeah. What's the saying, Kelly? Uh, we always say it, garbage in, garbage out. So if the yeah. data is rubbish and you're putting it into a model or to a report, your outputs are not going to be great. So data management always first. Okay. Do we have the question in the chat? Yes, I think I actually jumped the gun a little bit. I posted a little bit earlier. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so just to end off, um, we just wanted to share some resources and some learning platforms that are available on SAS. Let me just pop that up. So there's three main resources I want to share with you, and I'm going to navigate you through the site and show you where you can access these resources. The first is um, SAS Certified Young Professionals. These are free resources that you can go into immediately after the session. Um, it gives you access to software as well as materials. Um, and other learning resources as well. I'll show you the SAS Academic Hub and then the SAS Via for Learners. That is our platform where you are able to access um, a bunch of different applications from report development to some of that data transformation. You have access to forecasting, machine learning, et cetera. So I'll show you some of these as well. Just give me one second. The first thing I want to show you is the SAS Young Professionals um, certification. So the, with the certification, again, you get access to the SAS software. You get access to materials to learn about the software. So as part of the certification, you'll have access to the programming materials. So you can learn how to become a base programmer in SAS as well as an advanced programmer in SAS. There's also access to the machine learning certification as part of um, this package. And you have um, access to the visualization and reporting aspect as well. There is um, resources to help you prepare for certification. And then you can actually, um, once you feel ready and you've gone through all the courses, you can actually um, take an exam and become officially certified. Um, but if you go through the material as well, you earn a learning badge. Um, so these learning badges you can use as part of your profile, but when you get certified, you'll also get a, a badge. And these badges are great because it's an extra add to your CV. You can add it to your profile and it shows that you have acquired a skill in 
any one of the disciplines that I mentioned. So programming, advanced and base, machine learning, or visualization as well. Okay, so I'm just gonna give me one second. Can you see my browser? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, uh, I'm gonna share the, or Kelly, if I can ask you to share the link in the chat, please. So it's just, um, if you Google SAS certified young professionals, this link will come up. Um, it will take you directly to the page over here. It'll give it a little description. You can see the different um, resources that you have available. But um, from this page, you can directly just sign up and get started. So once you sign up and get started, it's um, letting you know what the starting package is, and then it's telling you who it's for. So it's for university students, um, undergrad, postgrad, and PhD. So you would just need to keep put in your information. Um, please use your uh, university email as part of your email to sign up. Um, just mention what you're studying when you expect to graduate. Um, once you sign up, you'll instantly have access to the SAS software as well as those um, resources that I mentioned. And the resources are training materials, so tutorials, videos, and actual coursework that you can work through. Okay. I know we have Andre Zinske on our line, which is our um, senior manager for our academics. And he manages all of the academics from the different universities. I don't know if there's anything else, Andre, you want to add with regards to the Young Professional Certification? Um, thanks, uh, Melissa. Hello, everybody. I, I just want to add that the certification that you get through this program is it is global cert, uh, certification. Mm -hmm. It is certification that is recognized globally. Um, it is something that is administered by Pearson View or Credly, um, uh, the new, <clears throat> new company that has taken over Pearson View. And um, it is recognized anywhere in the world uh, with um, that you have achieved uh, a certain level of skill uh, with your SAS knowledge. And many employers uh, these days give preference to somebody mm -hmm. with certification, qualification behind their names. And in some studies in the US, they have found that um, people with a certification get uh, just below 10% higher salaries than people without the actual certifications. So certification is really something that can distinguish you in a job interview situation. Um, and there are some companies in South Africa that uh, if you apply and you claim to have SAS knowledge, they are going to ask you for your certification qualifications. So it is extremely important to um, look at this um, spend some time on it, uh, and then actually get the certification. That's all I want to add. Thanks, Melissa. Excellent. Thanks, Andre. Um, the next resource that I want to navigate you to is the um, Academics Hub. And again, the Academics Hub is a, um, it's a platform where, again, there's a bunch of different materials from SAS that you can utilize. So again, we're going to just put the link in the chat as well, but it's a bunch of different online resources. If you navigate to the link, you get two options to either um, log in as an educator or as a student. If I log in as a student, again, it shows you, you get on-demand technology available, access to possibly do your certifications as well, and then learning um, materials. Um, if you register, for the hub, again, you would just need to put your email in. I'm already registered, so it's automatically taken me to the hub. Yeah, I can see I have access to different things such as webinars that happened, um, tutorials, videos, etc. So it's like a free learning platform for you to get to know SAS. It's really great. There's different learning parts and certifications that you can take. 
So yeah, I can see I have statistical analysis, predictive modeling available, machine learning certification, visualization, etc. So there's a bunch of resources that you can go into and um, utilize as well. Okay, so I recommend that you definitely do register for the young professional certification as well as the academic hub. So these are free resources that you can access immediately. Uh, Melissa, there's a question in the chat about how much does it cost to actually take the exam? Um, so the exam cost will um, vary under, I don't know if you want to cover this, but I think it's dependent on how the exam is administered. So if you do it within a, um, with Pearson or Credly as it's now known, um, because you are using the facility as a student, you would get a 50% discount on the cost. Um, but if the exam is hosted by the university and there's an invigilator, so there's a bunch of students that are interested in getting certified, then um, it will be free. Um, Andre, correct me if I'm wrong or if there's anything else that... Um, yeah, the free exams... Um there's a chance that it might not go beyond the end of this year. Okay. Um, but the free exams, if it is uh, hosted at the SAS office or uh, what we call a participating university, um, these can be free. Mm -hmm. So um, if there are at least five of uh, the group that wants to write the certification exam, um, then I will facilitate um, if COVID rules allow um, to have it done at the SAS office, or we can work with um, the DAS team to um, get somebody as qualified as an uh, invigilator. Uh, and that qualification is from Pearson View or Credly. It's not a SAS qualification. Um, and then we can help you guys at least free until the end of the year. Um, if I will speak to Professor Harley uh, about this um, for uh, for next year. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks, Andre. Was there any uh, other questions? Another question. Sure. Um, yes, it's been answered in the chat, so okay, we're good. All right, great. And then the last site I just want to show you is the global certification site, and basically, f whether um, this is for now or later on in your career, um, you can actually become a certified um, data scientist by SAS, but you can also have access to a bunch of different um, certifications. So if I go to credentials and I go to advanced analytics, I can go to this data science certification and I can see what it's made up of. So the certification is, again, it, looks at that data curation piece, but it also looks at the advanced analytic certification that comes with it. Um, so you do a the data, data piece, you do a big data professional certification, you would do machine learning, um, computer vision and natural language processing as well as part of the certification. Um, but yeah, you can get more information on this through the site as well. So it goes through each of those sub certifications that you would need to be a certified data scientist within SAS. Um, but my recommendation is definitely do start off with the um, certified young professionals, because as part of that, you would have the foundation. So the base SAS certification, you would have some statistical um, and ANOVA analysis certification. Um, and you also get a taste of that machine learning certification. So once you do it there, you already have the certification. So if you do this data science certification at a later stage, you don't have to redo that as well. Okay, so yeah, definitely do check out the site. We will share the links to the Academics Hub, to the Certified Young Professionals a page, as well as the Global Certifications page. Okay. All right. Is there any questions? 
Um, can I just add one more site or community group that could be useful for you guys? Um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with meetups. So essentially you can have meetups for anything, you know, you can have a meetup for hockey or playing computer games, but there's actually also one for data science. Um, I will copy the link to the data science Johannes group here. So it's not affiliated with SAS or any other company for that matter. It's just professionals within the community coming together to share ideas or share um, experiences and knowledge. So I find that it's a really great place to discuss um, ideas or just finding a mentor or something like that. It's got about just under 2000 members and it's a very diverse group of people. So you have some students, some young professionals who are just starting out in their careers, but all the way up to you know the, the CDAOs and executives um, all, are all part of this. And um, there are events usually around every quarter and every quarter there is a different um, topic. The next one is actually next week, Wednesday, where one of our SAS speakers is actually also speaking. We'll be talking about COVID-19 and how data science has uh, made an impact. And then there's another one in September coming up. So if you um, heard about what Melissa said about soft skills and you feel like you need to brush up um, on those skills, where SAS is actually sponsoring a trainer, a soft skills trainer to come in and give a one hour training. So she'll be teaching you things like, you know, how to do a presentation, how to structure it, how to tell a good story and things like that. And then the second session, there will be a panel of um, executives and managers who manage data science teams. And they'll actually be sharing some really useful information. They'll be talking about what they look for in candidates and interview tips. So they'll share those secrets with you. So if you're gonna be interviewing something soon or want to brush up on those skills so that you'll be successful when you're looking for a job that's also going to be super useful so make sure you join at the link that i shared in the chat okay do we have any other questions I don't see any other questions, uh, Melissa. I just wanted to say to everybody that's still here in the meantime that, I mean, I can tell many people have had some, some problems with um, connectivity and such. We have been recording the session and it will be available on the DSAD uh, website. Um, so if, you, if you're if not sure how to get a hold of it or where the, uh, the research group website is, please just contact me directly. I've already put the link onto the chat and I will do so again at the end of the session, um, just so that you, you know where to go looking for this. Um, I, I'm not sure if there are any more. Thank you for the links, uh, everyone. Um, for those of you on, please just make sure that you actually take note of all of these links that have been provided here uh, for the academic hub, for the certified young professionals, everything, even a blog site has been provided here for you um, by colleague, our colleagues from SAS. So, um, and these links are very, very useful. I'd really advise that each of you just at least copy and paste them down, even if you don't take a look at them now. All right. Um, since they okay, and um, one last thing, I have collected all the responses. So if you've sent an answer to me, I have collected those. We do have quite a few of you who have answered every single question, right? So we're just going to do a randomizer and um, we will send it through and announce the winner shortly, most likely today. Well, that's good news. That's good to know that there's more than one with <laughs> in theory. <laughs> yeah. um, I just want to thank you both very, very much for being here today and for all of the useful information and the insights that you've provided everybody with. I think this was a very, a very exciting um, morning to spend. Um, if there are any further questions and you only think of the question at a later stage, you can either contact me or you can contact Kelly and Melissa. I'm pretty sure they'd be happy to answer any further questions that you all have. Um, but I'd just like to um, thank our speakers one last time.
Thank you so much. We really appreciated your time and all the effort that you put into this. And I also hope that we will see the rest of our audience tomorrow for our second day of the workshop. Um, also, I'm thinking will be a very, very exciting morning. So yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And please keep in touch. If you have any questions, any queries, anything you'd like more information on, you can, uh, you can contact me directly um, if you're not sure who to contact. And I will happily put you in contact with the right person. So thank you. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good one.